It wasn't until 1940-41 that President Roosevelt ordered the, the, the U.S. Army Air Corps to start training African-American pilots and mechanics because prior to, prior to 1939, there were absolutely no black pilots or mechanics in the, in the, in the, in the U.S. Army Air Corps. Okay, so I reached 18 years old in, in September and, and around October I decided to join the Army because I, I didn't want to be drafted and end up in the infantry or a truck driver. So I, I told my parents, I'd better go downtown today and sign up. And I went downtown to the place in New York City called Whitehall Street where you could enlist rather than be, wait to be drafted. And I got down there around 7 in the morning and by the time I left that building at around 7 in the evening, they served lunch to us. I got sworn into the Army and they set a date for me which was tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, you had to be down at Pennsylvania Station with a little bag with just a toothbrush and a comb. That's all you should bring, plus the clothes that you're wearing. And we're going to take you out to the Army base in Long Island and, and uh, get you uniformed up and send you down to Alabama. Well, my mother had a fit when I went home that night and told her that I was going into the Army tomorrow. She says, you don't do things like that, Fred. Well, they, they're doing it now. So my father escorted me down to the, to the railroad station, Pennsylvania Railroad Station, uh, uh, the following morning and saw me off. But I had to go to Alabama in order to be trained for the Air Force. Got on the train and the first time I got a taste of discrimination, I had to change trains in Washington, D.C. The train from New York only went as far as Washington or whatever. And while I was in the lobby of the Union Station, it's a huge station in Washington, D.C., Union Station, that is where they split us up. Now, I was in uniform by now. You, know, you understand I'm in uniform. And the, all the white soldiers got onto that side of the port portion of the tra troop train going in the same direction because, the tr of course, the train is going to various places, not just Tuskegee. And all the black troops, all the black soldiers had to get in the forward section of the train. The white troops in the rear section of the train where it was more comfortable, the blacks up front where they got all the soot from the, from the we were using steam locomotives still in those days. No diesel engines, all steam locomotives. And they threw a lot of crap in the windows as the train progressed down the line. And that was my first taste of it. Also in that same Union Station, I, it was the first time I had ever seen uh, restrooms marked colored, C-O-L-O-R-E-D, and white. Now even though my fellow classmates in, uh, in Harlem told me that's, that's what it was like down south, I didn't believe them. You know, I said, sure, yeah, yeah, you could sell me anything. But now I saw it live for the first time. This is 1942, October. Colored and white separation. So, got on the train, went down to, uh, to Tuskegee, Alabama. Got off the train in a place called Cheho, Alabama, and they had a truck, army truck waiting. Now I'm really in the army now. I got a uniform, getting on an army truck. And they took me down to Tuskegee, and that's where I started my military career. Uh, there. And the base consisted of all black troops. The only white people on that base were the instructors. Now it stands to reason they had to have white instructors. There were no black instructors, no colored, in, in those days you used the term colored. There were no colored instructors anywhere in the United States, so we had to have white instructors. So the white instructors lived on one side of the base. After the, at the end of the day, they would go to their barracks and we would go to our barracks. The, the blacks were the majority, we were the students and the trainees, and they were the instructors. In fact, by the time I arrived in Tuskegee, the first fighter squadron had already formed up because the program started in 41. They had uh, maybe, they had, probably had about 35 pilots and maybe about 200 ground personnel, including mechanics, armorers, like radio technicians, and so forth. And I was to fit into one of those slots. So I went through the two months basic training. I thought for sure that we were gonna end up in the infantry because we were real infantry soldiers. Nothing to do with airplanes. Running up, up, up and down the hills in Alabama, rolling around in the mud and shooting rifles, Thompson submachine guns and Colt 45s, all that kind of stuff. No airplanes. <laughs> I thought I was being sidelined, really. Finally, upon graduation from uh, mechanics uh, infantry school, they sent all of the other troops in my platoon and the other old platoons to the Air Force training bases. Everyone left except maybe about five of us. Uh, 
remain behind because we were already mechanics. There were about four or five other guys in the same boat that I was, I was in who were already mechanics. And they assigned us to an active fighter squadron. It, it would be just as, as, as though you walk into the uh, Air Force today off the street and they'll say, see that F-22 over there? That's yours, you're the crew chief. I said, you kidding? And he says, yes, yours. You're a mechanic, right? <laughs> but these were Curtis P-40s. That was the, the hottest airplane going around 1939, you know. And I became, uh, I didn't run into I made one, one, one big mistake during the training program. I had to recycle me and that kind of, I retracted the landing gear on a Curtis P-40 by mistake while sitting on the ground. <laughs> and... <laughs> because I got overconfidence. You know, I got to the point where I wasn't even reading the instruments or the, or the controls. Anymore. I would just reach and pull and push things, which they always taught us, don't ever do that. Well, I learned my lesson the hard way. And when I fly, I still fly. When I do, now I never put my, place my hand on any device in an airplane unless I look to see where it is I'm placing my hand. So they transferred us to a base up in Michigan for, for combat training, Selvage Air Force Base, just outside of Detroit. And now we were happy to leave the South because, you know, down there we had to walk on the on separate sides of the street as the white citizens. If we were downtown Tuskegee or, or Opelika or those little towns out there or even the state capital of Montgomery, Montgomery became infamous later on with Dr. Martin Luther King. You'd go down there, they had the movie houses, but the movie houses had separate, two, two separate, the one place where you pay, pay for your, your ticket, but two separate entrances. It said colored on one side and white. So I figured I'm glad to get away from all that nonsense and go back up to Michigan. And up in Michigan wasn't a heck of a lot better, to tell the truth. But it was up north, and there wasn't as much discrimination. And we had more freedom to walk around, do things, and go places. Then it came time for us to go overseas. We were in Michigan. We got on a troop train two days before Christmas. And they took us down to Hampton, Virginia, where they had this huge base prep where they prepared the troops to ship overseas. Embarkation points, they called it. So, uh, got on the ships in Hampton Roads, Virginia, the first day of January, and we, we were part of a convoy. In those days, the ships traveled overseas with convoys because the German submarines were out there. And they split our group up onto, on three separate ships. Instead of putting all the eggs in one basket, they, each squadron had its own troop ship. In addition, to, we weren't the only things on the ship, only, only people on the ship, but our squadrons were separated so as to split us up amongst three different boats. And that convoy had about 80 ships and about 20 or 30 warships escorting us across the Atlantic Ocean. And just outside of Spain, German submarines attacked, the, attacked, the, uh, attacked our convoy. And the Navy, U.S. Navy really put on a show for us. They had everything, black smoke on the water. They were throwing depth charges all over the place and they were shooting. And those little destroyers were like Harley Davidson's running through the convoy, really. Those things put on a show for us. And there for the first time, for the first time since we joined the army, we realized that, that we were in a real honest to goodness war and people were trying to hurt us, you know. Everybody's attitude changed that day.